Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is John Morgan. I'm the marketing manager here at TMC. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Optical Table Vibration Control Systems for Photonics Applications. Uh, Mike Georgialis is going to be our presenter today. I just wanted to uh, lay out some of the ground rules. Um, the uh, audience is on mute, but we definitely want to get questions. So please, as we go through the presentation, uh, type your questions into the panel on the right, and we've left time at the end here to, to answer those. Uh, also, we ended up with uh, more um, content than we could cover in one webinar, so we've actually broken this up into two parts. Um, so this is part one, and part two is next week. Also, we, will, we are recording this webinar, so you can uh, watch it later or share it with your colleagues. Um, and with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Mike George Ellis. I am the North American Sales Manager here at TMC. TMC, we're full, our full name is Technical Manufacturing Corporation, and we're a manufacturer of all sorts of vibration control systems for high precision, uh, high, um, uh, high sensitivity, instruments and uh, manufacturing equipment and, and all sorts of, uh, of, of things that are that can be sensitive to vibration, which I'll talk about a little bit later, specifically with uh, relation to photonics. Uh, I have a background in physics and i um, been working here at TMC now for uh, about eight years. And um, we're headquartered just north of Boston in a town called Peabody, where we have all of our manufacturing and, uh, and engineering and, and sales and operations are all, are all here in our, in our factory on the North Shore of Boston. Uh, this webinar is broken, as John mentioned, into uh, two pieces. It's going to be a two-week series and uh, focused on optical table vibration control systems. Uh, and uh, the next series will be, um, will be next week, uh, same time, same place. And we broke this up because as we were working on the content for this webinar, we kind of realized that vibration control for optical tables is actually a pretty complex subject. You've really got to look at the system, but then there's two parts of the system. You have your optical tabletop, which is a uh, complex structure. We also have what supports it, the isolation system from below. And as we were working on this, we noticed that we learned that, that there's really too much to cover in just one hour. So we split it up into a two week, two hour type of seminar. And, um, and the first week talking about an introduction and then on optical tables. And the second week focusing on isolation systems uh, for those structures. So today we're going to start off with just a brief uh, introduction to what you're looking for and what types of applications these types of systems are to support. And we're going to have a brief crash course on floor vibration, of uh, how it works and what causes it. Then we're going to get into what we think, uh, based off of 50 years of working with photonics customers, what kind of things are required in an isolation system for a photonics application. And then we're going to get a little bit deeper and a little more technical and start looking at optical table performance and construction. The next week, we're going to get into, we're going to, we're going to start looking underneath the optical table. And we're going to say, well, they don't float in air. They, well, actually, a lot of times they do float on air, but uh, something has to support them. So we're going to talk about isolation systems, uh, combining, and then uh, different types of isolation systems as well as uh, planning for floor vibration control and a, and a very compelling case study, uh, which um, is, is a common story of, of, that we hear a lot where a researcher is in uh, one location and then needs to move to a new location and, uh, and all the challenges that come with that, particularly with, uh, with a focus on the different vibration conditions between the two locations. 
there's a lot of vibration sensitive photonics applications and this is sort of a small list of the types of applications that we've seen and we've supported over the years and it's been a, uh, an interesting run because I, I love our photonics market because the types of challenges that we find there are often very unique uh, and, and also can even be you know, world changing in, in some cases. Uh, the petawatt lasers is one of my favorites. So if you go to the University of Austin, you've got the petawatt laser down there in the basement of the physics building. That's that. I, there's actually a photo of that laser right here on the on the upper right hand. And these are the types of optical table systems that can snake a, a, around uh, columns and through doorways and from part to part of uh, in the basement of a physics building. So these really high powered lasers. We, we work on a lot. Uh, we have the interferometry, interferometry is a big market from our, of ours as well. When you look at uh, the upper left photo, that's a Zygo interferometer. Zygo is actually a sister company of ours. We're both under the Amitech umbrella. They're down in Connecticut, so we work closely with Zygo on a lot of types of interferometry applications. Um, on the um, Below the, the interferometry photo on the lower left, a very, very common confocal laser scanning microscopy application with all sorts of uh, different uh, peripherals and umbilicals. And things like that. And, and the system in this, in this case, if you look at the, the very bottom, is an active uh, uh, cancellation system, which we'll, we'll talk a lot more about active systems in the second week. And uh, on the right hand side is, a, is an example of uh, ultra fast optical spectroscopy and that is actually the um, the application that we'll be covering in our case study in the second week we build uh, optical tables for all different shapes and sizes for these types of applications and, and one of the things that we very much pride ourselves on is, is a focus on what the customers needs are so that we can develop uh, optical tables to, to fit a wide range of applications so sources of vibration is a pretty, uh, pre it's pretty intuitive. It's just something you don't think about very often. And uh, the thing about vibration is that it's everywhere. And what we're also finding is that, that particularly if you have a microscope, it's the low frequency range. And I, we also find that uh, low frequency can also be a problem for a lot of photonics applications. It just depends on what types of resonances are in the components of, of your system. Once you start getting into higher frequencies, we start seeing acoustics taking over. So floor vibration is gonna have an impact on your instrument between one and probably 30 to 50 Hertz. But once you start getting 50 Hertz, you start getting into audible acoustics and moving air in the facility and things like that. There's really not a whole lot you can do about that from a floor vibration isolation perspective. That's where you start looking at facility remediation or acoustic enclosures and things like that. And floor vibration in particular is caused typically by um, things like footballs, people walking in the building, people walking in the lab. Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you have a large building and it's filled with people that are walking, the period of human walking is about half a second, which is roughly a two hertz, um, which is roughly two hertz in impact every, you know, up to the two hertz of rate of impact. And uh, that cumulative, cumulative uh, effect of everybody walking in the building tends to be a, a two hertz building resonance. You know, you have nearby rails and traffic, so trains and cars all going by shaking the ground. Elevators moving up and down shafts vibrate buildings. Then you have your standard pumps and motors and mechanical equipment, so your HVAC handlers and vacuum pumps and all the other things that are going on. What's also interesting is um, nearby construction. So we know that a lot of folks that are doing photonic work are oftentimes in environments like university environments where you have a dynamic campus, which is constantly building and renovating uh, buildings on campus, but also in downtown urban centers where there's uh, oftentimes construction going on. We even consider seismic noise, but we're not talking about uh, seismic noise like tremors and earthquakes. We're actually talking about an interesting geologic phenomenon, which we call the micro seismic peak. And what the micro seismic peak is, is the 
cumulative, the, the cumulative effect of all the waves and all the world crashing on all the shores. And if you have a seismometer sensitive enough, you can really sense this, uh, this low frequency peak from 0.2 hertz to about 0.4 hertz pretty much anywhere in the world. So, uh, so flow vibration really comes uh, from the ground and it comes from all the inputs that are in the ground uh, uh, that I just mentioned. Another thing that's interesting about floor vibration is that it exists vertically and horizontally. And you know, vertical is pretty obvious. If I'm on a upper floor of a building and I'm jumping up and down or even on the ground floor, I'm causing the floor to vibrate vertically uh, and it's kind of like a drum head. But we also see uh, horizontal noise. And depending on the type of building, uh, you have uh, you can have wind pushing the building from left to right at low frequencies. And what's so interesting about um, about that, that that horizontal motion of a, of a sway of a building swaying in the wind is that you have the floors rigidly connected to the walls. Or if you're in the basement, and even if you have an isolated slab, you have these footings from the building that are underneath in the in, in the ground, and you have this horizontal motion causing uh, what could actually be, uh, which could draw uh, at, 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 a, at, a, at, a, at a point where the floor meets the, um, the wall, actually creating a torque on it and doing what we call the drum head effect and creating vertical vibration. So vertical is almost always higher uh, in, in a building. And what's interesting is it's difficult to measure floor vibration because it can vary over a thousand times from location to location. So you, when you're measuring floor vibration and, and measuring vibration is, is, is a topic I cover in another webinar, but um, you got to be careful because uh, you can measure a vibration in a floor as a standing wave, and you can happen to place your um, sensor at a node and see very, very little, but you move over a couple inches or a couple feet, you might see a, a lot of floor vibration being at an anti-node. You could also, uh, it's also affected by mass and the location of columns and things. So if you're near a column, you're gonna have less uh, vibration than if you were sort of in the center of a floor. And you also be careful when you're talking, thinking about floor vibration. Uh, you've gotta be able to distinguish between floor vibration and vibration from other sources. And uh, and there's a lot of sources such as uh, acoustic and barometrics, which affect uh, not only the system by pushing on it, but it can also affect the isolators if there are isolators. Um, anything sound waves and pressure waves, uh, things like that. Um, your own system is going to have its own resonances, and I'll talk about resonances in, in later slides. Uh, but you also got to be careful about payload noise, and if there's noise on the payload, and by the payload. I mean anything that you have sitting on top of the optical top. All of that could be either sources itself or could be what we call mechanical shorts. They could be bringing in vibration from off the tip, from the floor or from the environment or from a piece of equipment onto the table. And the key is you got to have different strategies to manage these sort of all these different sources. And what we're going to be talking about here is we really want to be talking about the floor vibration and how to create a surface for you to put your photonics setup on that is um, that that's going to be isolated as best as possible from the floor and hopefully influence as little as possible from all these other sources and when you think of an optical table and a photonics setup you really have one goal what you want to do is you want to maintain the inertial state of the system to mitigate relative motion among components. And so when I look at my lower right diagram here, I've got my payload and it's maybe a laser shooting at some kind of detector. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that that, this, that that laser here and the detector here aren't moving relative to one another. And there's really two factors that factor into that, which is why we split this up into two weeks. You have your optical table and its damping, which, um, which, which is one of the most important factors. And this is the kind of thing that reduces the effect of vibration not coming from the floor. So if you've got tables or somebody knocking on the table with their knuckles 
or um, fans and things like that that are generating its own noise, a well damped optical table is something that helps you um, mitigate that sort of non floor noise. It's also important though because it combines with the isolation system to reduce floor vibration effects. So whatever's coming up in the isolation system is going to uh, come up via a transfer function, which we'll talk about later, but that's going to be energy put into the table. A well damped table will help you with some of that energy that's transferring through from the floor as well. And the whole idea behind damping is that you're taking this energy into this massive stiff object and it's absorbing it and converting it to entropy. There's really a couple different ways to do damping that we'll talk about, but you want to absorb and somehow just disperse uh, that energy in that table. The next thing that you want to talk about is isolation, which is very different from damping because isolation is, uh, is what allows you to um, uh, really filter out what's coming from the floor uh, from hitting the optical table. And when you look at isolating systems, you really want them to be a system that's very, very stable. There's a lot of types of isolation systems out there, but if it's resonating very high, um, if it moves very easily in response to onboard motion, uh, and, and if it doesn't, and if it has a transfer function that provide that 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 resonates at, at frequencies you're sensitive to, uh, you could have issues. So, so you want to think about these as systems because they affect each other, but you also need to look at the performance of each um, uh, a little bit separately. And uh, so, 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 so this week we'll, we'll focus on, uh, we'll start talking about the optical table and focus on damping. When we think about an optical table, um, what we're really trying to do is create something that has a very high level of stiffness with relatively low mass. And I showed a photo uh, before here, this torsional flexing. And this is sort of an example of a vibrational mode that you can see in a table, which uh, I'll talk about a lot more uh, in a later slide. But to, co to combat that flexing and those vibrational modes, you really want to see a high level of stiffness. But you also want low mass. Uh, when you compare this to another very uh, other stiff objects that are used for this type of thing, like granite or concrete, it's very expensive to buy granite. Uh, it's very expensive to ship it. Um, concrete can't be uh, made with a, the level of accuracy necessarily as you could with a granite by grinding a granite block. Um, and the more mass you have, uh, the more structural support you need in your building, but also the more uh, uh, the more you need to provide isolation support underneath it. You need to have uh, isolation support that's proportionate to the mass of the system. So what we do when we create an optical table to kind of create this high, rel high stiffness, low mass type structure is we use a honeycomb core type construction. And honeycomb is, is sort of a, uh, it, it's, a it's a word to, to, to basically bring to mind the, uh, the, what a honeycomb looks like. It's a cavity core a hexagonal cavity core, and um, and and we rely on really the I beam principle for this. So if you look at optical table construction, you've got a top skin which has your optical tables, you have your bottom skin, and in between you have these vertically standing sheets of honeycomb uh, bent steel, and this allows you to have a very high um, stiffness because by the I-beam equation, you have uh, it's effectively a very, very thick piece of metal uh, in the vertical direction, but very, very thin uh, in the left to right. So you have something that's very, very stiff vertically, but, uh, but also very, very light. And the key is the more core, we call this our core, these, these bent pieces of these, these long I-beams that run the length of our table, we call it the core. And the more dense your core is, the more stiff your table is going to be. Of course, the more um, massive it's going to be as well. So you've got to find a balance between uh, core density and stiffness. Thermal stability is also influenced by whole ceiling methods and table construction. And thermal stability is kind of an important point because um, when you've got temperature fluctuations in a lab and if you've got a, um, a, a 
lot of components that are independently mounted to your table, you start seeing a warping and bending, not only of the table itself, but also the, the different materials and the components. And every component is going to kind of expand and contract uh, a little bit differently. So uh, you can start getting that misalignment. So one of the things to look for is all, all steel construction and steel to steel contact when you're looking at these you know, monolithic math and massive table structures. There's other important factors like flatness and ergonomics and magnetism and, and ability to join them and customize them, but these are non-vibration related. So um, I'm not gonna talk about those types of features because I really wanna focus on the features and the construction of the optical table that really help its performance. And, uh, and, and it's really all about damping. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about, about damping and what it is. And when we talk about damping, um, we have a few different figures of merit to describe damping. And, and, and it's my second bullet on this slide, but I kind of want to, I kind of want to really emphasize that really there's no perfect figure of merit for, uh, for really measuring optical table performance. They're, they're, they all uh, have a lot of assumptions. So you can kind of look at them as a way to kind of get a good idea and compare relative performance, but actual performance of an optical table really can't really be measured uh, by somehow extracting information from compliance information. And uh, what compliance is, it's a measure of how much a point on a corner of the table moves in response to a known force. And so compliance basically takes a measurement at one corner at one point on a table and it sees how much it moves and what we do when we do a compliance test is we hit a table with a hammer and we know from this hammer it's called a force hammer how much force we've hit it with and then we take them an accelerometer and we measure how much acceleration we feel in relation to that that hammer hit and when you when you do a compliance test you kind of get two different curves and you get a convert, you get the first curve that you look at is uh, the curve on your right, which is a corner compliance curve uh, uh, for any red, uh, for any regular table. And it's a it's a it's a curve that shows um, basically the, uh, uh, the, the, mo the relative motion in inches per pound foot. Uh, so how much how much it moves based on how much force you put in, and then the frequency of that of that motion. Or, and, uh, what we see here is rigid body behavior until a, until a valley, and then our first peak is typically our, uh, our our first resonance. So every peak after that then represents a resonant mode of the table. And in general, in general, if you want to talk about how stiff a table is, uh, you want to see a first resonant peak that moves higher and higher and higher up the frequency spectrum, but also um, lower and lower and lower in amplitude. And each one of these different resonances tends to represent a different modal shape. And every, um, every table is a little bit different, but just as examples, you'll see that this first uh, resonant frequency you might have a modal shape where the corner, the, the opposite corners are up and down. Whereas the Second resonant frequency here, you might see a shape which sort of a, is a sort of a U-shaped uh, with a valley in the middle of the, of the two corners. Uh, you might have sort of a twisting mode or even like a sine wave type mode at higher frequencies. So tables twist and turn and torque at all sorts of different angles. And so compliance is important because it gives us an, in, an indicator of how stiff one table might be, all, th all other things held equal uh, relative to another table. And uh, another thing that we look at uh, is uh, a ring, what we call a ring down test. And this is something very, very simple as if, uh, you, if you think about damping and think about how well a table's damped, if you wrap on a table with your knuckles, uh, a well damped table will have very little noise from that. Whereas a um, undamped or a completely undamped table, maybe even a piece of steel uh, supported rigidly will ring quite a lot like a bell. So we do what's called a ring down test, and you uh, and a ring down is 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 a measure of how long a table takes to settle after a certain amount of time. So we on the on the y, on the x-axis here we have a, a uh, millisecond scale, and uh, we have a velocity scale on the y-axis, 
we're looking at uh, uh, an impact. So we have an impact at time zero and some uh, vibration from that impact and it settles down over time. And again, when, when we're looking at damping of a table, you wanna see that, 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 that decay faster and faster and, and happens sooner and sooner. And that's, a, that's an indicator of, of how well damped the table might be. And when you look at um, the types of damping, how do you damp a table is the next question. We have these massive steel structures that we've bonded together uh, that have air gaps in them and they're fairly complex. And uh, and you've got to, and you ask yourself, well, you're doing these tests and you're trying to see how well it's damp. Well, 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 how do you actually damp a table? And commercially, there's really two available methods for damping tables. Uh, the first is a broadband damping, and what broadband damping means is, is, is if you take your, uh, if you understand what the term broadband means, is we are actually trying to dampen the table at all frequencies. There's not, it's not a frequency dependent damping. This is a method of damping that is designed to bring all frequencies, all resonant frequencies down equally. And the way broadband damping is done is simply by adding mass and adding steel to the table. That steel is mounted to the table using some sort of lossy compound. So it's sort of a soft springy type. Uh, anything that, like I said before, damping is going to want to uh, dissipate energy into the form of into ent into entropy, and uh, and basically uh, dissipate any en energy. And that's what this lossy compound and this mass is doing. We're taking large masses and, and a lot of lossy compound and building it into the table so that uh, we're effectively absorbing frequencies, uh, the resonant frequencies, at, 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 in a broad uh, frequency spectrum. What's interesting about broadband damping is that it provides this performance regardless of what the payload is. Because if uh, uh, if you look at um, the resonant frequency of the table, and one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later is that resonant frequency of the table as measured in the factory isn't always the same. Because once you start loading your table with equipment in the field and you have it on isolated systems and all the other things, your resonant frequency is gonna change. So broadband damping is a great way to safeguard against changing resonant frequencies of a table. Narrowband is the other commercially available um, uh, type um, damping method. And what narrowband damping does is it actually builds mass tuned dampers into the system. These are sort of little oil spring pods and the amount of oil in there is, is, is adjusted to match the resonant frequencies of a table, of an undamped table. So, so uh, you know, a, a general way to kind of do this would be you'd have an undamped table, you do a compliance test on it, you would identify its resonant frequencies, and then you'd install these mass spring dampers that have a resonant frequency similar to those. And you'd want those to create some sort of interference at that specific resonant frequency. So it's an interesting way uh, to, to kind of select and choose those resonant frequencies. Um, which is interesting because um, uh, it can be very effective, but once you start to introduce a payload onto the table or you support the table in a way which changes its resonant frequency, for example, leg locations, the support points of a table are gonna be very, very important in determining exactly what frequency it's, it's resonating at. Once you start introducing these sort of uncontrolled variables, a uh, mass tune dam system can all of a sudden become uh, an ineffective damping method. It should also be mentioned that every table
I think I'm going in and out of mute. Is, uh, is everything okay, guys? You did blank out for a period there, but it was less than a minute. Okay. Um, hmm. Uh, let me just sum up the let me just go back and then uh sum up the um the the, the, the um broadband versus narrow damping uh, uh basic uh basic summary so as, as i had mentioned before uh the broadband damping is going to uh lower all frequencies equally the narrow band damping attempts to identify the resonant frequencies of a table and start and then you design a damper to tune out only that frequency the fundamental issue with the narrow band is as you change the um mass that the, that, the, that the table supports or if you um support it from underneath from different locations which is important the, the locations of your supports are are are, are important uh, you can uh, actually change those resonant frequencies. So if you have um, these external factors that could change your resonant frequency, a mass tuned damper all of a sudden could become uh, ineffective. And I should also mention that you've got multiple resonant frequencies and multiple mass tuned dampers, uh, which could really make this uh, a quite a difficult problem to solve. And so these charts here, they they focus on broad, broadband damping. And the point that I'm trying to drive home here is the influence on the first resonant peak uh, compared to different levels of damping. And by different levels of damping, I'm talking about adding in more mass, adding in more lossy compound, and doing that at all frequencies. And the most influence uh, that you're gonna see, but you see it on all the resonant peaks, is, uh, is, is a, lowering of the amplitude and a shifting forward of the resonance. And you can see that here in the low case, especially in the low versus the high case. In the low case, you've got a, uh, a resonant frequency here around, uh, around 250, 260 hertz maybe. And uh, their compliance is at roughly 30 times 10 to the negative so I'm sorry, three times 10 to the negative fourth uh, inches per pound. Foot. You add in your uh, some, some level of damping, not our full, you lowered that resonant frequency almost by half, and you've shifted it forward maybe 10 or 20 hertz. You kind of see that the other resonant modes are also shifting forward and lowering, which is what you would expect from broadband damping. And then again, when you split you add in a lot of lossy compound, a lot more mass, you've really come to almost a critically damp state here where you've got a very, very low resonant peak frequency. And you've got, uh, again, much lowered um, uh, peaks for your higher frequencies, your higher modes. So all tables are created a little bit differently. And what we speak about, uh, one of the things that uh, you can do when you buy a table is you can vary its length and you can vary its uh, thickness. And there's two other figures of merit that we tend to look at, which are, um, I should say one more, because I've already talked about dynamic rigidity, uh, so compliance. So if you look at length versus thickness, your compliance is going to change based on length and, length and thickness of the table but also your static rigidity, which is uh, the deflection in response to static weight. I put a force on my table or a weight on my table, and that table is gonna want to deflect. And the amount that it deflects in response to that weight is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, their static rigidity. So let's just look at these charts real, real quick about how table length and table uh, uh, um, uh, affects it. So, and, and table thickness. So each one, uh, we have compliance here. So here's your compliance. And what we're trying to illustrate here is the thickness of a table versus uh, the length of a table. 
And here's what you see what you, you see what you would expect. As the table gets thicker from eight inches to 12 inches to 18 inches to 24 inches, you got a stiffer table. Your compliance uh, is getting um, lower and lower and lower uh, as the table gets thicker and thicker and thicker. But also as your table gets longer and longer and longer, your compliance uh, trends to get tend to increase and increase and increase. So if you really have a need for a very, very long table, like a 16 foot table, and you have a low tolerance for compliance, you'd want to really beef up the thickness of that table and use something maybe 24 inches thick to get as little compliance as possible. Your static deflection is another, uh, another important guy. I, I described it uh, just, just recently, but again, it's relative to table length and table thickness. And you see the same sort of effect uh, with compliance. You see um, the thicker your table is, the less it deflects, and the longer a table is, the more it deflects. And then your lowest resonant frequency, I kind of mentioned that before, which is another way to look at your compliance, your or your or dynamic rigidity. Again, you sort of see the same types of thing. Uh, as a, a lower frequency indicates a softer table, uh, a more compliant table. And so the thicker your table gets, eight inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, 24 inches, the um, higher your resonant frequencies are, but then the longer your table gets, the, um, the, the, the lower your resonant frequency becomes. And so we see other figures of merit out there uh, for, for, for tables. And, uh, and some of the ones that uh, we've seen in the field are uh, people talking about something called the dynamic deflection co coefficient. And uh, that's calculated. So what you're trying to do with both of these is you're looking at some frequency on the, uh, on the compliance curve and you're assuming some input and then you do some math um, and uh, to figure out this third coefficient. And, um, and so the dynamic deflection coefficient, coefficient is the square root of the damping coefficient divided by the lowest resonant frequency cubed. So you need to know two things. You need to know what your damping coefficient is, which um, is often not provided. And you also must need to know, you also need to know your lowest resonant frequency, which is dependent on the table support and the mass on the table. Uh, maximum relative motion is also sometimes uh, 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 a factor or a figure of merit that's referred to. And you basically take that dynamic deflection coefficient that I mentioned before, and you try to describe two displacements, uh, displacements between two points opposite, opposite each other. So it's almost like a compliance curve, but it's talking about two points opposite each other and how they displace relative to each other. And what you've got to do is you've got to take your dynamic deflection coefficient and, and you multiply it by the power spectral density of a theoretical input. And you say, okay, well, if I have an input of this much energy into my table, this much power spectral density energy, um, then I will have um, you know, this much relative motion between two points based on my known based on my known lowest resonant frequency but assuming that there's no mass on the table assuming the table is supported just so and um, assuming this constant input value so this confuses people and even the compliance curve can be confusing because there really is no standard of measure and even compliance curves being a pretty nice method of measurement there's really no standard. You know, one company might do a measurement of a compliance curve and they might place an accelerometer six inches from the edge. Then another company might place uh, the accelerometer for that measurement eight inches from the edge and then hit it with a hammer at different locations. So, you know, we as an industry have, have done a poor job of really creating a standard for how to measure these types of things. So you have this compliance curve, which is kind of differently done uh, from, from manufacturer to manufacturer. But then you have these other factors that are derived from the compliance curve 
um, which are also supported, the, which are which are further influenced by how the table supported and how the table is loaded. And the key takeaway from this slide is, you really can't predict real world performance uh, from any figure of merit. Really, uh, you're, you're given a, quite a lot of information, and you got to think about an optical table as a system that. Uh, it has a construction and it has some figures of merit that are measured in theoretical uh, uh, terms, but how can we take this information and, and think about which one is actually going to meet my needs? And there's a whole lot of other things to look at uh, beyond uh, figures of merit to consider. Uh, my last slide for today is uh, going to talk about active damping, which we've seen uh, out, out in the field. Uh, and I want to be very, very clear that we don't want to confuse your active damping with active isolation. Uh, because remember, damping is a characteristic of the optical table, and it's designed to uh, absorb or somehow cancel or somehow um, uh, resist motion and other energy inputs into the top itself. Uh, isolation. Is something that we talk about when we're specifically saying this is energy that's coming from the ground and this is what we're doing this is the system that we've put in between the table and the ground uh, to, to to prevent that energy from even getting into the table and so it's a pretty simple active feedback control system and we're going to talk a lot more about active feedback control uh, in next week's session but what you're really trying to do is you're trying to create destructive interference. You know, you've got a um, you've got a pretty simple active feedback control system that consists of the three things that any active feedback control system should have. It needs to have a sensor, it needs to have some control loop, control loop, and it needs to have some sort of actuator. And so what the goal is is the sensor is going to sense some wave or some motion on the tabletop and it's going to send a signal into the controller and that controller is going to effectively going to try to condition and flip that, that, that um, signal out of phase and then it's going to tell the shaker to do the out of phase signal. And hopefully uh, you can create um, this destructive interference uh, uh, with what's going on on the table. And the point that I want to take away here is, in theory, this is a pretty good um, idea. But what you've, what we found is, these are actually very complicated systems, and they, you know, um, we have a lot of resonant frequencies that we try to uh, try, try to cancel out here. And the ability to put energy into a system and hope that you're putting that energy in at the right location and at the right rate to match up with all of the other factors that are causing this table to vibrate, um, sounds like it becomes a pretty complicated problem. So in general, um, active isolation can be used sparingly, but I would say, uh, I would say uh, active damping can be used sparingly, but you really gotta be very, very careful when introducing new energy into your system. And so I would say it's something to be used with extreme caution. I'm going to conclude and then end with a, uh, a brief preview of next week. Um, but, uh, but, in, but in summary, vibration comes from many sources and each source requires its own mitigation techniques. And so when you're looking at your payload vibration and your acoustic noise and environmental noise coming in from around and on the payload, damping is going to be what you are looking for. But when you've got a vibrating floor from those external influences like people walking and trains going by, you want to start be th you want to think about isolation and don't confuse isolation with damping even if you have active damping that's not isolation uh, many figures of merit uh, try to exi exist to try to characterize an optical table uh, but the reality is mass and stiffness are are the most tried and true that mass is going to help you with the broadband damping that stiffness is going to lower your compliance and 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 um, and the more mass you have, the more stiffness you have. Uh, those are the uh, those are the old uh, good old standbys. And uh, do not confuse active damping with active isolation. I just said that. And uh, next week uh, we'll focus on isolation systems and their filters, their springs. 
and every optical table needs to be put on something uh, to so that it can exist in your facility. And um, what we have, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about rigid supports, like in this L-shaped top here, which has no isolation. We're going to talk about passive isolation system, like the uh, very common dumbbell piston type uh, air sealed uh, air spring chamber type legs. We're going to talk about active isolation systems. So these are uh, primarily piezoelectric uh, active control closed feedback systems. And then we'll finish off with a uh, really nice case study uh, about an optical spectroscopy experiment where uh, we had a customer, a, re a researcher in a very, very nice uh, basement floor of a building which uh, was being moved, uh, their lab was being moved and um, to a fourth floor in another location on campus. I think a lot of folks here could probably relate uh, to, uh, to the pains of moving uh, from a basement to a fourth floor. Uh, we actually see this kind of thing a lot, as, as I mentioned before, universities can be uh, quite dynamic places. And, um, and uh, sometimes the decisions that are made um, are, aren't always uh, in the best interests of the research. Uh, so that ends my um, uh, uh, presentation for today. And if uh, I will um, let it, hand it back over to John, uh, who will MC any questions we might have. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, we do have uh, several questions here. Um, again, I'd like to encourage anybody, uh, if they have any questions, go ahead and type them in. We'll, we'll do our best to get to them. Um, first one. Um, I am a university physical plant engineer. I anticipate that your products will mitigate outside vibration effects. What is required from building infrastructure, such as compressed air, to make your products functional? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you, if it's a simple optical table, then uh, house air is all that's needed at 80 PSI. Uh, that's uh, that's at the very simple level. If you start thinking about uh, active vibration cancellation systems, and you've had, uh, you say you you have a known vibration problem, or if you've had a vibration survey done, uh, and you've noticed that there could be resonant frequencies that might be a problem for you, uh, I really think you should join uh, next week's uh, session to talk a little bit more about um, you know uh, uh, vibration cancellation. Uh, just to make sure that you're, you're you're putting in the right type of table, but uh, but if you think that you want to be thinking about an active system, then from a facility standpoint, you need to be looking at your floor construction because um, there's going to be um, the need for increased stiffness, or we will have a stiffness specification that needs to be met. If it turns out you have to go to the the active route. Okay, thanks. Um... You actually just mentioned this moving uh, moving tables from lab to lab. So the question is, uh, you say that the table support locations are important. Aren't the table legs generally in the four corners? And then what happens when tables are moved from lab to lab? Oh, that's a great question. And I, I actually wish I, I was doing this presentation. I kind of wish I had a slide on that. Um, but uh, I'll go back to this slide. This this slide and. When I mentioned the, uh, the the location of the legs, uh, they're actually the formula that helps you uh, I, uh, ideally locate where those legs are, so that you support it in a way that excites the fewest modes uh, and also um, gives it the less the least amount of deflection. And if you go to our website, we actually derive the formula. But um, what's really interesting is that uh, if you were buying a leg, a, a table of length L, um, it works out so that the optimal location of the legs is typically 0.56 L. And so that's our recommendation for, for locating legs. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another one. Um... I was under the impression that floating on air tables take away outside vibration effects. The structure of the tabletop itself affects the vibration of the table with what is going on on the table. So, 
not exactly phrased as a question, I guess, but I think I think the question is, you know, they also you also have to worry about what's going on on the table, like if things are moving or whatever. So. Yeah, I, I and I and I agree with that. Uh, if I understand the the, the statement correctly, um, you've got your optical top, and you've got many things on it. You might even have people. Uh, you know, you're going to have cables coming up from it, uh, coming up from off the ground into the there. You're going to have you know people setting a coffee coffee cup, coffee cup on it. You're going to have motors and things like that. And all those things that are that are being fed into the top, and even people speaking uh, in the facility and air and, and air flowing from the air handling system, all that's going to induce energy into the top. And that all that energy that's being induced that, that the top is absorbing is going. The only way to deal with that is um, is by damping. And then you have the people jumping off up and down in the facility and the, uh, the the building shaking in the wind and all those things that are feeding into the floor and you're damping the, the and, and the number one line of defense of that is your isolation system the legs that you put the table on and as we'll talk about next week we only can offer transfer functions it's not like uh, you're floating in air and you nothing transmits through an isolation system to the table Energy is going to come through the transfer, the, the isolation system uh, via the transfer function of the spring. And that energy is going to go into the tabletop. And some of that energy might be damped, but some of it uh, will not. And so, uh, so, so um, it's, good, it's good to uh, think about it in, in, in two things. And I think you have the right um, impression there, because, uh, because if, as I understand your question, um, I agree. Yeah, the next one is sort of along the same lines. Uh, you know, it's um, I think this this person's um, setup has Sterling pumps and cryostats on the table. So, what's the standard mitigation strategy for that sort of thing? Yeah, um, the the best thing that you can do is rely on damping, and and I would not, I definitely would not try active damping for that uh, because the active damping. It's what it's going to try to do. It's going to try to focus on the resonant frequencies of the table itself. Um, you're, I think, broadband and something massive and stiff uh, is going to be the best thing that you can do to try to uh, have that energy from those in, from those those components absorbed into the table, and hopefully, less and less of that transmits through the table and through the skin to you know the places where you're sensitive to it. So really, damping is going to be your number one uh, uh, support. I've seen folks um, do little isolation systems of their own on their tables, you know, home, homegrown kind of small isolators on top of the table, supporting um, part of that part of the setup, and a little bit of added isolation. Uh, you know, that that could work for your for your setup. But um, but really, damping is is really your only line of defense against onboard noise. Okay, thanks. Um, in one of your early slides, you mentioned other non-vibration related features uh, to look for when selecting an optical top. Can you talk about what some of those are? Yeah, these are sort of the, uh, I would say pro there, there's probably two that I would say are absolutely critical uh, to you know the life of your table and the, the performance of your table. And there's, there's kind of a handful of others that I would say are just kind of like nice to have. Uh, the two absolute critical uh, ones are, um, they sort of go hand in hand, and that's the way the table is sealed. Um, and, you know, in the old days, optical table, uh, you know, guys are all familiar with tables, they, they have, you know, an array of threaded holes on them. And, uh, and, and a long time ago, uh, those thread holes just basically went straight into the core of the table, and every hole kind of had its own core cavity. And, uh, and that was it. And over time, what you'd find is that somebody would be working in the lab and spill some coffee or, or beer or whatever down the table, and that would cause the, it would sneak down into there and cause the core to rust, and that rust would then generate forces among the internal core components between the skin, and then your table would start to just expand and bow, and, and, and things would just get ugly. And so one of the innovations that was a TMC innovation um, a couple decades ago now is to seal 
every individual hole. So every one of our cut, which has since been copied by some of our competitors, but we put a little plastic cup that's epoxy sealed and gasketed on the backside of every single hole. And that helps prevent moisture from getting in and causing these rust problems. So sealed holes is, is absolutely critical. And then the way you seal your hole is very, very important. And I wonder if I have any photos of that in here. Uh, no, I don't. But if you go to our website, you'll see, a, uh, you'll see how holes are sealed. And there's kind of two schools of thought. There's the individual hole sealing method, which puts a cup on the back side of the hole, and then you have your core coming up on either side of the cup, and the core is in direct contact. Oh, wait, I think I do have a uh, photo. Uh, we can kind of look closer. Yeah, here's your little yellow. Yeah, here's your little yellow cup, and uh, and uh, sealing the hole. And you've got your um, core here that is metal core directly in contact with the metal skin of the table. The other way to do this is have a giant vacuum formed plastic sheet of, of sort of cups and lay that entire layer, that, that vacuum formed plastic layer of cups between your core and your skin. So it's effective because it stops moisture from getting in, but it also breaks the connection between that steel to steel connection, which is really important for thermal, thermal stability. It's a much less expensive way to make tables, but it really, you start to lose your monolithic construction by having this layer of plastic, this layer of soft spring material, um, which also is influenced by the amount of weight that you put on it and can start to deform over time uh, as it's loaded. Uh, you have this sort of like secondary layer of, of foreign material in, in, in a structure that's supposed to be, you know, really monolithic and, and contiguous. Good question. All right, Mike, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the presentation and thank everybody uh, who attended and hopefully we'll see most of you next week. Great, thank you all and have a great day. Thanks.